Would you stand with me, please, as we read together? Reading from the Luke, the 16th chapter, beginning of verse 1. He also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to him, what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for this, your holy, inerrant, infallible word. And as we come to this passage today, a little bit difficult in some ways to interpret, we pray that you will give us clarity of understanding. More than that, that you will help us to know how it applies. May your spirit do his work in us. We would certainly be remiss, Father, if we did not remember mothers today. We thank you for all those who are here. Father, uh, parenthood is such an awesome responsibility to bring into, you've, you've given us, you've given us the ability to bring into being, bring into existence beings who will last forever, have an eternal existence. That is an awesome responsibility. So I pray that you will, Lord, grant not just joy in remembering the day, being thankful for the mothers that we have had who have been such an influence, but that you will also remind us of the responsibility that attaches to that privilege. We pray for those who have, mothers who have lost children or those who have seen children go through accidents or face other challenges. Along with the good, there comes the, just the normal course of events in life. Pray for those who would like to be mothers and for one reason or another, you have seen fit not to grant that desire at this time, at least. But Father, you've not left them bereft. There are always reasons and so we pray that you will help them to and help all of us to learn to trust you. Lord, help us to be faithful servants of yours. Thank you for returning Stan and his group from their trip last week. Thank you for the other many blessings of the week. Lord, we also think of those who are bereaved, those who have been in the last few months. Uh, Lord, that just another ongoing phase of life that reminds us how precious the time is and how important it is that we redeem the time that you have given us. It will not last for long. So we pray that you will give us that kind of insight, that you will use even this word this morning to speak to our hearts in that regard. We pray this in all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have not already, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 16. A, uh, there was a jury pool, you know, and so the, they were trying to get the jury together and the judge asked one woman, he said, do you, do you subscribe to capital punishment? She said, no, I do not uh, believe in capital punishment. He said, well, this is a case about a, about a man, a husband who Uh, took the money that his wife was saving up for a new dress and uh, he lost it at the track. The woman said, you know, I think maybe I could reconsider that statement about capital punishment. Um, We find that ironic, why? Simply because of this, money affects everything.
everything we think about. From the time we are first old enough to understand what it is and what it can do, money tends to dominate our thoughts. I can well remember sitting as a, uh, as best I can remember, would have been uh, five or six years old, sitting in our home, an old farmhouse in Nebraska, and looking, staring at the first dollar bill that I ever owned. I'd had a little bit of pocket change before that, but this was the first dollar that belonged to me alone. And I can remember looking at that dollar and thinking what, how, how much money that really was and sort of trying to figure out that in my mind. Money has a hypnotizing effect on all of us. Those who don't have it want some. Those who have a little want a lot. Those who have a lot want more. There's no end to our greed in a way. The Bible, of course, tells us that money itself is not the problem. It tells us that money is neutral. It is the love of money, the desire for money that is at the root of the problem. But that desire is infectious. Believers are not exempt. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 10, the Lord says this, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Money is like nitroglycerin, you know? If you handle it correctly, it can be very useful. But because of, of its volatility, it's a, it can be a serial killer as well. Few people can handle money without blowing themselves up. It's the truth. Check the history of the people who have won the lottery over the last few years since that has come into vogue. Check the history. Every once in a while, they'll run a TV program about the winners. You will find that more, than, more often than not, their lives have been ruined by winning the lottery. Money has glitz and it has glamour and it has the tendency to pull people away from the things that are real to the riches and the preservation and pursuit of those riches that have a very short shelf life. So it is no surprise, I think, that Jesus often is found speaking of money. Of the approximately 40 parables that we have in the New Testament that Jesus gives, at least one third of them deal with the issue of money. You are deeply mistaken if you think that the Lord doesn't care how you handle your money. He does. And that's true whether you have a lot of it, a little of it, or whether you're like most of us somewhere in the middle. It is in many ways a gauge of our spiritual temperature. So in Luke 16, Jesus is speaking of money. And we please notice in verse one, very first phrase, he also said to the disciples. He's moved from speaking to kind of everyone, the crowd at large, he is now speaking to his disciples. This is instruction for believers, beloved. This is for us. So we cannot now say this is for somebody else. It is for all of us who are sitting here this morning who claim to have faith in Christ. Jesus is speaking of money here. Now he does so in a parable in verses one through eight that we just read that we'll look at this week. Next week he gives three really fascinating lessons, kind of uh, application really, that fall out from the principle that he's going to establish in the parable. And I, I really urge you to be here next week because the application Jesus makes is really is fascinating. But in the first eight verses, we have the parable and we have the principle that's established there. Now, some have suggested that the emphasis here really isn't on money, but it, that it's really on our spiritual commitment in general. And certainly that's the underlying theme but it's without question a question of money. He uses the word riches once in verse 9. 
He uses the word wealth twice in verse 9 and in verse 11. Look at his summary statement in verse 8, and, and I'm sorry, in verse 13 at the end of this, he says, you cannot serve God and money. And if you look at verse 9, you'll see that he goes on and continues after the parable and says the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. Luke put that there for a reason, because this is about money. That's what Jesus is speaking of. Those who heard it knew that he was talking about money. And Jesus' intent here is to help us understand how God would have us regard and handle money. Now at first blush, if you were listening to this parable, I trust you were as I was reading it, it's a difficult parable. What is it teaching? Is it teaching us that it's okay to be making money out of other money? Is it teaching us that it's okay to use questionable practices in order to get money? Is it teaching us that it's okay to cheat someone else in order to solve our own problem? You could potentially derive any of those summaries from this parable. But of course, Jesus is teaching none of those, as we'll see as we look at the parable in detail. A parable, if you keep in mind the interpretive principle that parables always have just one main point. You know, they teach you in, in, in seminary, you cannot, when you're interpreting the Bible, you cannot make a parable walk on all fours. What that means is you can't assign a, a meaning to every simple thing that's in the parable. There's one main message. Get the main message. And there is a main message here, and we will get to it. So let's look at the parable that Jesus gives, and we'll look at it in kind of four points here. First of all, the crisis, the crisis in verses one through three. Jesus sets up a crisis. He says there's a rich man that Jesus invents for the purposes of this parable, and he has a manager managing his property, which was common in those days. He's overseeing his affairs. But Charlie, someone's come. We don't know who. Could have been a fellow worker, could have been a friend of this man who had seen this and was concerned about him, and so he comes. But someone has come and brought charges against this manager. And they tell the man, this man is wasting your resources. He's wasting your possessions. He's not being faithful to what you've asked him to do. Now, it, it, it looks like it's not a case of fraud. There's no legal action being taken here, but this man is playing fast and loose with his responsibility to his master. And so the accusation has come that he's wasting his possessions. The word waste that's used there in verse one is the same word that's used in Luke 15, verse 13, where we found the young man, the young prodigal was wasting, was squandering the property and reckless living that his father had given him. It's basically at its root, the word means to scatter. If you think of, you know, going to a high-rise building in New York City or something and start throwing $100 bills out the window, you kind of have the idea, scattering the wealth. It's going every which direction but where it should be going. We don't know how he's wasting the money. We're not told. Is he buying equipment that's unnecessary, perhaps? Is he lining his own pockets somehow? Maybe. Is he not negotiating good contracts? Is he not being faithful in that regard? So he's, you know, not, not, not getting the best prices that he might be able to get. Is he not managing the, 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 the human resources that are working for him faithfully? We don't know. But in some way, he's not attending to the responsibility that he has to this man to, to faithfully use his resources. So the owner's action comes in verse 2, and he says, what is this that I hear about you? It's an open-ended question. He's not telling the man what he's heard about him, but he's giving him an opportunity to say something. He's wanting to find out everything that he already knows and see if there's maybe anything else that the guy will admit to. It's an open-ended question. It's a common business practice then and now. But this manager's smart enough not to take the bait. He doesn't say anything. He remains silent. Now, his silence is an indication of guilt, but at least he's not adding any information that might make it worse. Apparently, he's decided that's the best course of action. 
But since the silence confirms the already incriminating action that has occurred and that has been accused, the, man, the, the owner has no choice but to say, in, I'm sure in great Donald Trump fashion, you are fired. This is the end of your employment with me. But I want you to finish your account. So he says, turn in the account of your management and you're fired. Now this precipitates a, a, a crisis for the manager, right? Because he tells us in the next verse that he is apparently too proud to beg, but he's either, either too old or he is too somehow physically unable to go do manual labor, and so what's he going to do? There's no government subsidies or unemployment insurance in those days to cover him. Out of a job means out of money. It means you go beg on the corner as the next option, and he doesn't want to do that, so he's in a world of hurt. What shall I do is his question. He's in crisis mode at this point. So then in verses 4 through 7, we have the cure. Given his, given his circumstances, the manager sits down and he begins to think, and he comes up with a brilliant scheme, brilliant at least for himself. It doesn't do much for his owner, but it's a brilliant scheme for himself. He says, I've decided what to do. And the, the phrase is, you know, it doesn't really carry the emphasis in the English that it should. It's like, it, it, he's, like he's saying something like, Eureka, I've got it. I know what I'm going to do. I've got this great idea. I've got a brilliant scheme so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their homes. Here's his plan. The manager's fired him, but he still has access to the books. He's still supposed to give a final accounting. So he can still get to the books. He still apparently has access to the, to the notes that are there. And it opens the door to an amazing possibility. Rather than use the access that he has to further the, the accounting that he's been asked to give, he, he comes up with, an, with another idea. He decides to take the notes that are owed to the owner and go to the people that owe those notes and give them a discount on their loans. He's going to discount them. And of course, this will ingratiate him to the people who owe the money. They'll like him. They will suddenly look on him with favor. So he'll be ingratiating himself to them at the expense of his master. They don't know he's been fired. Look at verse 5. It says he represents himself as still representing my master. So he takes the notes and he goes to the guy that owes him some money on wheat. He says, I'll tell you what, how much do you owe? And the guy says, well, I owe you, I owe you uh, $100. And the guy says, okay, I'll take, I'll take 80. And so he discounts him 20%. Takes another guy that has a debt on some oil of some kind. He says, how much do you owe? He says, $100. He says, okay, I'll take 50. And so he begins to discount these notes at his master's expense. He's using his master's assets to secure his own future. The implication is that there are more of these, obviously, than those two. But that's the key to the parable, to understand that he's using what still belongs to his master in order to further his own cause. Now, I want to take a couple of minutes to deal with the fact that commentators have a difficult time with this parable. They're not sure how to interpret it. How could Jesus be commending an obviously dishonest person? That can't be, so this guy must not be dishonest. There must be something we don't understand here. And so they have various ways that they try and clean him up. They try and make the manager look good. One of the ways is to say, well, the Old Testament forbade people to take interest on on loans of some kind, and so people would get around that by sometimes dealing in commodities as interest, and maybe that's what's going on here. And so the guy is going to the people and he's saying, listen, this was gonna be the interest on your note, you don't have to pay that anymore. And so he's, number one, he's doing the right thing himself, he's pleasing God because he's not taking interest, and he's really making his master look a little better because his master is no longer asking for this interest that was, that was undue. Everyone wins. That's one explanation. Others suggest that he has been illegally charging uh, interest on his own. And so that what he's doing is just discounting the interest that he was going to put in his own pocket and saying, I'm, okay, I won't do that, but in the meantime, I'll ingratiate myself to these people so that they'll be kind to me, they'll feed me, they'll accept me into their homes, and so on after this fact. The point is, it's all an effort by, you know, really 
some really fine commentators. Well, I hate to go against this, but some very fine commentators try and exonerate this fellow. But they all fail on one point, it seems to me, which is what? Well, Jesus himself calls him dishonest. Jesus acknowledges that he's dishonest. All you got to do is read the eighth verse, right? He's, dis he's a disreputable guy. God Jesus has purposely created a guy who is dishonest in order to somehow make a point. So he says in verse 8, the master commended the dishonest master. Any defense of this man's actions is nullified by the fact that Jesus himself says he's, 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 he's a bad guy. So, so what is the point? Is Jesus saying that the end justifies the means? Is he suggesting that any scheme to get yourself out of a jam is justified? You know, to, is he in some way commending dishonesty? Well, to answer that question, I think we have to look very carefully at the next point, which is the commendation. The commendation, which comes in verse 8. You would think Jesus would be condemning this man for his dishonesty, for his unscrupulous behavior, for his continuing to go down this road of, 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 of unsavory behavior in order, to, in order to further his own ends, you would think he would be condemning him. Instead, he's commended. The master that Jesus invents commends him. And then Jesus explains further. So in verse 8, it says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. So, so what gives? Should this, should this guy be condemned for major fraud? And the answer to that is in real life, yes, absolutely. What he's doing is wrong. And Jesus has specifically, I think, invented him for this reason. In real life, anything commendable about what he is doing would be overshadowed by the dishonesty with which he is doing it. But this is a parable. This parable has one main point. Jesus is specifically using this bad man to, 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 to get us to understand one critical truth that he wants us to get. So what is that critical truth? Three observations, I think, will help us get there. Observation number one, cheating is not commended. Jesus never would commend cheating. Jesus calls the manager dishonest, literally unrighteous. He names him for what he is. He doesn't gloss it over. He doesn't try and pull a rug under this and you know, sweep it under the rug and say there's nothing wrong with what this guy's doing. He calls him dishonest. It's acknowledged that he's dishonest. Jesus would never say that something dishonest is a good thing to do. So that brings us to the second observation. What is commended here is his shrewdness. It's not his dishonesty, but it's his shrewdness. Shrewdness literally means he acted prudently. And what Jesus is saying is, given the framework within which this man is working, he's working by worldly standards. He's working in a, in a, in a situation where anything could go. And instead of, instead of just uh, continuing his wasteful ways, he's now looking for a way to provide for his own future. He's thinking ahead. So there's a certain shrewdness that attaches to that. The way he did it was wrong. But the fact that he's doing something is what Jesus wants us to say. He's not just sitting back and doing nothing. He's doing something. And though the something is wrong, the fact that he's doing something is to be commended. He's not commended for his cro crookedness. He's commended for his shrewdness and planning for his future by worldly means. But then the thing that really nails it is the third observation, which is simply Jesus' comment. Jesus says, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. So what is that about? Well, Jesus is, you know, let's just go through the phrase a, a, a word at a time. He's saying that the sons of this world, that would be unbelievers, those who have nothing more to look forward to than the next 30, 40 years, whatever, however long their lifespan may be from this point forward. The sons of this world, unbelievers who are looking to here and now, are more diligently in investing in a temporary future. Temporary because it can't last very long at best. They're more diligent investing in that temporary future than the sons of light who are believers are investing in their eternal future. 
It's the shrewdness. It's the planning for something that in the long scheme of things doesn't mean much. Are the next 30 or 40 years you're going to live important? Sure they are. Are they the most important thing you face as a, as a life face, as something you face in life? Absolutely not. Because the 50 years after that, and the 100 years after that, and the 1,000 years after that, and the 10,000 years after that, and the million years after that, you're going to still be. You have a life expectancy, beloved, of forever. God's created us that way. And what Jesus is saying here is, this guy who is using worldly means to try and provide for his temporary future is smarter than a believer who's doing nothing to provide for his eternal future. How dumb can you be? That's what he's saying. John MacArthur sums it up this way. He says, sinners are more skilled and diligently in securing their temporary future in this present age than those whose citizenship is in heaven are in securing their eternal reward in the age to come. When was the last time you really thought about your eternal reward? When was the last time you really gave consideration to the fact that you're going to live forever? And that God says it's important what you do in this life. Most unbelievers are working harder to secure their 10-year retirement than most believers are working to secure their eternal retirement. That's what Jesus is saying. The point is we need to get a lot more focused on using even our physical resources to secure eternal privilege than to just build up something that isn't going to last very long. Should we provide for retirement? Absolutely. Look at Proverbs advises us. Go to the ant, consider her ways, how she you know, gets, gets the food in the summer to provide for the winter. God doesn't leave us void with regard to this life, but he's saying, realize you're going you're gonna to be around a lot longer than just this life. So you know, if you wanted to summarize what Jesus is saying here in a few words, it would be don't waste your life, invest your life. Don't waste your life just on things that are here and now. Invest your life on things that will have eternal value. Hard lesson to learn. Hard lesson to learn. But I'll tell you what, wise people learn it. So let's go to the fourth point here, which is the correlation. How does this correlate to my life? What does Jesus want? The audience is believers, so by way of application, we're all there. The rich man is God. God is the one who owns everything, everything in this universe. And the point of the parable would be that the, that the God who owns everything, the owner, has given into the hands of all of us, who are his managers, certain resources. Certain things are provided for us. Everything that God has gifted us with is part of what God has bequested to us. So we, the disciples, and by, impl by further implication, us, are the managers so we have, a, what, what Jesus is teaching is we have a fiduciary responsibility to make the best use of the things he gives for our sake as well as for his. To provide for our eternal future. So how can we ensure that we are not wasting his gifts but are investing them? Well, it might help us, first of all, to just ask ourselves, you know, well, what are some of those gifts that God has given us? Well, we all, we all have the gift of time, right? We, we all have that gift. We all have the same 24 hours a day. So we all have the same gift of time. So whether it's the 24 hours a day, whether it's the lifespan of 60, 70, 80 years, whatever it turns out to be, God has given us the gift of time. And the question is, how are we using it? He advises us in Ephesians 5, 16, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. The implication behind that is, what are you doing to deal with the issue that the days are evil? What is it about your life and, your, and the investment of your time that's being used to help redeem an evil culture? What are you doing in terms of your time to help bring wisdom to the culture in which you live? A culture where God is being systematically ignored, where God is being systematically pushed aside. 
that we see more and more of all the time and we'll continue to see more of. In what, in what way does your work and your leisure and the things that you do in terms of your time, in what way do they, do they forward what God wants to do on earth and in what ways do they not? You know, we, we don't have to look very far. I mean, we could talk multitudes about this, but let's just take leisure time. Let's just take the way most people spend their leisure time, right? Let's talk about, let's, let's talk about TV, social media, you know, video games, a few things like that. How do you spend your time? Is there anything wrong with those things? No, they are neutral things. They can be used for relaxation and they can be a good thing, but they can also be a lot of wasteful things. See, the two questions to ask about how you're spending your time is, number one, what is the content of it? What kind of activities are you watching, involved in? Is it edifying or is it not? And parents say, I mean, this is really important. I mean, I'm not against video games per se, but look, let's face it, a lot of the video games are not edifying in nature. They're teaching your kids how to kill and how to rob and how to do whatever. So what do you do? Get some controls. You're still the parent, right? God gave you responsibility. He gave you an eternal being to be responsible for. How are we going to answer to God? So what kind of content is in those things? And then the second thing is how much time are we spending on those leisure activities? Is it just enough to kind of recharge our batteries? Or is, this, or is our, our world now revolving around these things, around these hobbies, around these mind relaxing things? And I, you know, I can't answer that for you. You have to answer that for you. But here's a question. What does the way you spend your time show about what you love? How does the time, how does the, how does the, the number of days and minutes, uh, minutes and hours in a day that we spend on some of these things relate to the amount of time that we spend in God's word, in prayer to the God that we say we love, in ministry for the God that we say we love. What's the comparison? What does the way we spend our time say about what we love? Time. How about spiritual gifts? Some of you are saying spiritual gifts. What spiritual gifts? We haven't talked much about those lately, but God has gifted all of us, right, as believers. The teaching of, our, of the word of God, he says in, in Romans 12, 6, having gifts, abilities to serve other people spiritually, differ, and, and they differ widely, you know, teaching, Preaching are the obvious ones, but there's the gift of helps, there's a gift of administrations, there's a gift of giving, the list goes on and on. In the, in the Bible, he says, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. He didn't give us gifts to argue about and to try and sort out what they are. He gave us to them, them to us to use. So Paul advises, use them for God's glory. Figure out what it is that you're to be doing. What is the mission that God has given you that's associated with the gifting that he's given you? We could spend so much time there. How about another precious possession that God has given us? The gospel. The gospel. You know, we are, we are recipients and we are um, handlers of the greatest news the world has ever known. You can't save yourself. But God will save you if you'll just ask. And God says we're responsible. He says in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God, by which he means the gospel. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Are we faithful in sharing the gospel with others? You know, in, in, in asking them, would you like to go to church with me? Would you like to join our Bible study? What do you think of Christ? Well, I mean, what are, what are we doing to, 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 to try and take the best news that God has ever given to mankind, stewards of the gospel? So all of those are just ways that God has gifted us, has given us things that we need to be using. They're, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg, obviously. But in this particular parable, there's one other thing that God wants us not to squander. 
And that's what this passage is mainly aimed at, which is what? Money. This passage is mainly aimed at money, material possessions. God did not give us what we, whatever it is we have so that we can squander it simply on ourselves. Is it okay to buy things for yourself? Absolutely. Is it okay to have nice things? Yes. But the Bible is really clear that God has given us money and he's given us the ability to earn money so that we can help others. It says in first, there, there, you go passage after passage, but just take this one. In 1 Timothy 6, 18, he says, he says concerning those who are, have been entrusted with money, he says they are to do good to be rich in good works. He's not really that interested in how rich you are in dollars, see? But God is very interested in how rich you are in good works. Why? Because he, according to Ephesians 2.10, created the good works for you. So you could, write, so you could walk in them. Are you, are you walking in the good works that God has created for you? He's created good works that we should walk in them. He says they are, those who have money are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. Next week, Jesus, we're going to see how Jesus really expands this and how he expects this to work out. See the application that he gives to this. So please don't plan to not be here next week because it's about money. Because you, you need to be here. You need to hear it. If I need to hear it, you need to hear it. God is always gentle with us, beloved, but he's also clear. Here's how you invest in eternity. And that's what we'll see as we come together. So let me, how would I wrap this up? Well, let me, let me ask you this. If someone were to write your obituary today, what would it look like? What would it say about your life? If I were to go around and just ask your friends, okay, what's the most important thing to this person? What would they say? Because see, that tells who you are. And it can be changed if it needs to be. There was a man named Alfred Noble, Swiss man. 1888, he got up and one day he got to do something very few of us get to do. He read his own obituary in the paper that morning. That was a bit of a surprise. Who was it? Wasn't it Mark Twain that said, I get up and read the paper every morning. If my obituary is not there, I go ahead with my day, something like that. But this guy found his obituary there. So I don't know what you do. You just die? But there's his obituary. And, 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 and why was it there? Well, it was there because, because his brother Ludwig had died in France, and somehow the newspaper got the story mixed up, so they wrote the obituary on Alfred, who, would, who had made a fortune uh, manufacturing and selling dynamite. And so the heading on the obituary said, the merchant of death is dead. And Alfred Nobel took issue to that, to that headline. He didn't care for that. Didn't want that to be his legacy. Thought, man, if that's, if that's the legacy that I have, if what I'm going to be known as when I'm gone is that I was just somebody that helped people kill other people, I don't want that. So he set about for the next few years of his life to take some of the wealth that he had accumulated to see if he couldn't change that legacy. And of course, that turned into eight years later when he died, he had put millions of dollars away into to funds that would benefit humanity that we know today as the Nobel Prizes. Changed his... When you think of him today, you don't think about dynamite, you think about the Nobel Prizes. You have a different legacy. Beloved, some of us need to change our legacy. We need to look at it and say, How, what is my identity? What is my goal in life? Where am I investing in eternity? And where am I hanging on with both hands to here and now? Here and now is going to be gone really quickly, really quickly, much quicker than you think it's going to be gone. We used to have a plaque hanging on our wall at home. It said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When I was 10 years old, that probably didn't have the impact on me that it does today. 
But listen, in light of eternity, that 60 or 70 years or whatever difference isn't going to be anything. Only what's done will Christ, for Christ will last. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. Pray that, we pray that, Lord, Lord, we, I, I, Lord we have, there are well-intentioned, good-hearted people here, for the most part. And yet, Lord, we so easily get caught up in the things of this life that are important, but they're not most important. And so easy for us to get those at the top of the list. So easy for us to have our idol. And we go there every day and we bow down. And we give you lip service because you're somewhere down the list a little further. Lord, would you somehow get a hold of our hearts? How we would love to be those that you could say, yeah, those, those guys are spiritually shrewd. They're laying up treasure in heaven. Help us to learn how to do that. Help us to be faithful at doing that. Help us to be motivated to do that. And Lord, we need the power of your Holy Spirit to do that. We do not come by this naturally. So we pray for that. Place in our hearts the things that you want to see from us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.